Father, we thank you for a day like this that you saw from eternity past. You made provisions for us to come into your presence and just to give you praise, to worship you in, in all that you are. Lord, I pray that we grow in our knowledge of you and we grow in our heart knowledge of you. Lord, that we would uh, call you by name, know that we are your children, that we're welcome in your presence. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself as holy and mighty, loving and powerful, just and merciful. And Lord, we are humbled in your presence for who you are. Lord, forgive us for thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. But Lord, I pray that you allow us to cast our eyes upon you. And Lord, we, we pray that you would give us a holy distraction of the world and that our attention would focus more on you than anything else. Lord, you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of all of our attention. as We exalt your name. Father, I pray that you give us ears to hear. And Lord, just the, the courage to change where we need to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We will be considering the Sermon on the Mount and looking at the very last, which is in chapter 7. So the Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and some incredible lessons that are learned. And if you would, if you would start, just peek back over to chapter 5, looking in verse 1, as we begin this series uh, on the family, just two-part, last week and this, this, this week, last week is on marriage, today's just on family. But we look at this, and today we're going to be talking about building homes that last out of Matthew 7, 24, and 27. But I want you to see something in chapter 5, starting in verse 1. In chapter 5, starting in verse 1, you have a, this list of all these blessings. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the one that is poor in spirit. Blessed is the one who, who mourns. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those that... Uh, that are the peacemakers. And so this is less of a prescription and more of a description. It's less of you need to be like this and more of since you are like this, if you are cast downcast, if you are hurting and you are mourning and you're really wanting righteousness, here's the truth. Jesus has come to fill you up. Jesus has come to bless you. And so as Jesus literally crosses or is baptized as if coming out of the Jordan and then going into 40 days of uh, temptation like Israel was 40, days in the, 40 years in the wilderness and now his inaugural message and he basically, like Moses the lawgiver, Jesus is coming as the grace giver. And he was saying, listen, if you're hurting, if you're down, if you're trodden, then I've got, I've got some great news for you. And then he begins to explain to you and to me how we are to receive these blessings, how we are to walk in the kingdom of God now. Now, definitely the kingdom of God is to come in full force, but now there is a, an heir of the kingdom of God, if you will. Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand, as Jesus said. And so for you and for me to experience the rule of Christ, the kingdom of God in our life, then we look at chapters 5, 6, and 7 for sure. But what I want you to see is how the first part, chapter 5, starts with these incredible blessings, and it ends with curses, in a sense. Here's what I mean by that. You, you look at uh, verse 13 of chapter 7. Here's an incredible story. Enter through the narrow gate. What's the narrow gate? By following the teachings he just said. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate, difficult the road, that leads to life, and few find it. He's saying, listen, I just brought you this good news. You need to listen because the way of destruction is broad. It's easy to find that road. Then he goes on, verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. In other words, there's lots of voices out there. There's lots of preachers. There's lots of things to believe, and you need to be very, very careful. Because on the outside, they look good, they look like sheep, but on the inside, they're what? Wolves. They're going to eat you up. And then he said, here's how you know them. You know them because of their fruit. Verse 16. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, 
but a bad tree produces bad fruit. In other words, you can tell people by their lives. I mean, what I believe comes out of my life. It just does. It actually comes out of my mouth. What you believe comes out of your life. That's what happens. So here's what he says, verse 19. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So do you see this? The narrow, the narrow road leads to life. The broad road leads to destruction. The tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. And then verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you'd depart from me. Man, some very drastic words as we are coming to a halt in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Starts the blessings, and this is available. The blessings are available. But if we don't appropriate, if we don't pay attention to the blessings, then the cursings will come and the destruction will come. And so what you and I have right in front of us, from the very words of Jesus, not from me, not from a council, not from a denomination, but from the very words of Jesus, you got two roads. You got two options. And you know what the good news is? They're there for yours for the choosing. You have the right to choose it. It's not like you've been born in a lot and predestined to go this way or that way. You right now with your chooser, you choose which way you want to go. And then he tops it all off with a simple story. Let's just read the story. Verse 24, Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, because of these, these statements and all the Sermon on the Mount, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who builds a house on the rock, or you'll be, you'll be wise. And you'll be like this guy who built your house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it did not collapse because its foundation was the rock. Say rock. That's right. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a what? Fool or foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, the river rose, the winds blew, pounded that house, and it collapsed. And look at this statement. And the collapse was great. Crazy. So, we have two options. Before you and before me. Build on the rock or build on the sand. Let me show you a picture of a house that was built on the sand. Here's what it looks like. This is a crazy picture. Look at that guy. He's sitting there going, man, I used good nails. I had the latest fashions of paint. I had an amazing roof. But one decision caused a massive collapse, and it was the, where he built. Now look at this house, the next one. That's built on the rock. That's not going anywhere. Now he probably... Had a, had a nice designer. He probably used the right nails. He used the right paint. But there was one decision, and that was to build it on the rock. So here's what this tells you and me. We fret about a lot of things. Maybe our carpet or our wood. Maybe our car. Maybe our roof. Maybe our bushes. We get all uptight, and yet we forget about the main things. We throw away the things that matter, and we hold on to the things that don't devastating. And we get all frustrated about the things that are a problem. But the reality is we need to get a clue. And here's what I want you to see. Number one, there is a designer to the home you live in. Not necessarily. Now, you know we're transitioning from actual a building to a life, from the actual material house you live in to the home you're trying to build. There's a big transition going on right now. And that's where we focus. And there is a designer to a home of relationships, of the way you treat people, of the way you talk to God. And here's what it says. Uh, verse 24 says, Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, those that are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So looking back up into this incredible statement of Matthew 25, 4, and this is actually the parallel passage And speaking of this. 
that there is a sense, that there is a designer that is very serious of, which, of, of painting the picture for you and for me of which road we choose. And you must know this, that there is eternity at stake. So yes, I really, you know, this is, this is a personal opinion. I really believe that God is concerned about your actual physical home. I think he wants everybody safe. I do believe that. But not near the way he's concerned about your eternal life. He is the true designer. He is the one who is, who is uh, just planning your growth spiritually. He's made a way for you and for me. But if we don't follow that way, there is actual consequences. Because to not follow the design is literally to speak poorly of the designer. To not follow his ways is to disregard his very character. So your life and my life is a praise unto God because he's, he's the architect of our life. So that's the designer. He's very serious. He makes a way. He makes a provision. Everything you've ever needed spiritually, Jesus took care of when he was dying on the cross, right? Everything. So there's the designer. And then also there's the builder. That is you. You are building something. This passage makes it clear in verse 24. Everyone, everyone has a possibility of designing a beautiful heart, an incredible uh, love within that, that, you, that you show and, and words that you speak. And it's for everyone. There isn't anyone who can't have this. Do you understand that? Listen, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. You may have had a house on the rock and then all of a sudden you start slipping off the rock. You know what I'm saying by that? You, 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 you made a dedication to the Lord, and next thing you know, you've been distracted, you got overwhelmed by something, and next thing you know, you're starting to build more on the sand. And right now, instantly, you can get back on the rock, back on solid foundation, but the choice is yours. You're the builder here. Whatever. Don't, don't blame other people for who you are. Don't, don't blame other people for, for the storms that come, because the storms come. Storms come, right? All the time. I remember being in a Bible study. I don't know how I was there. It was in Moore, Oklahoma. It was four months after the, the big tornado that went through in Moore, uh, I think 10, 15 years ago. And there I was, and there was a deputy sheriff there. And he, he actually uh, was telling me about all that happened. And there was another lady there that was the last lady to ever to get out of the hospital that survived from that great storm. It was a massive storm. It took out several, uh, it, it was several miles wide. It just whoo, went through Moore, Oklahoma. And the deputy sheriff was telling me that somebody in his department actually, after the, after the storm and they're all going in to rescue people, heard, heard a baby crying, right? And went around and looked and found a baby in a tree. Storms come and they devastate. And you have a choice. I have a choice to build on the rock. And so you are the builder. So it's, here, here's what he's saying in verse 24. As the builders of our lives, our own lives, everyone who hears these words of mine, and it's an interesting statement. These words of mine. Listen to these words. And so as, as you're listening, you are sharpening your tools for building. As you're listening, you are measuring. As you're listening to the words of Jesus, you're, you're taking account. You are counting the cost. And then you put it into action. Everyone who hears these words of mine and then acts on them will be like a sensible man or a wise man who builds his house on the sand. So you and I must be doers of the word. It is very dangerous to hear the words of Jesus and not do them. Did you know that? It's very dangerous. So there's an, there's an accountability issue going on. And so to, to know what's right and to not to do what's right is greater judgment. So uh, cheer up. You're now under greater judgment because you're now here. Now you know. Now you know. But you also have the opportunity to build on the rock, but you are the builder. Let me read you a couple verses. James chapter 1, verse 22 says this. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you, if you are that person, you are deceiving yourself. You may like to talk about the Lord. You may like to talk about the Bible and your favorite Bible verse. You might even like to listen to Christian radio and Christian songs. But if you aren't willing to do what the Bible says, there's greater judgment. It's not good for you. Luke chapter 11, verse 28, he said, 
even more, those who hear the word and keep it are blessed. So to hear it and not do it, there's a curse or a judgment, but the ones who hear it and do it, you are blessed. And then Romans 2 verse 13, for the hearer of the laws are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. So we're talking about engaging and putting into practice what we learn. So you have the designer God who's inviting you and me to build our house on the rock. You have the builders who, that's, that's us, we actually do it and we are responsible, but we also have the material. What do we actually build with? Well, I believe in this passage, what we're building with are these words of Jesus. As he says, you take these words of mine and you put them into practice and you will be blessed. That's very interesting. Luke chapter 6, verse 48, which is the parallel passage in the, in the, synop, the, other, the other gospel. He says this, He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the rivers crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. And look at what the man did. This is a man... He is like a man who is building a house who dug deep. You ever built a foundation? Maybe you can just put a fence post in. Uh, How many of you know it's kind of hard to dig around here sometimes? Kind of hard. My son and I were digging a trench, and for some reason we chose to do it in August, which is not, and rocks and clay and all, it was hard. It was hard. I I didn't know if I was going to make it. It was tough, but we made it. We made it to the end. Very difficult. Did you know that it takes work? It takes effort? Jesus talks about, you can find me when you search for me with all your heart. So there's a search that goes on for truth. And there are those that find it. There's many parables that speak about searching. And and, and when you find it, you sell all like the pearl of great price. And you put great effort into this. And you dig deep and you look and you find These words of mine, as Jesus says. Jesus even talks about, look, you don't throw the pearls before the swine. That there are some truths that you will only learn through study and hardship, the two going together. And then faithful living, just obeying God's word no matter what, and then God begins to bless. But it's your choice. These blessings that Jesus speaks about or these curses and the way you build your heart God is the architect, you are the builder, and the material are these words of mine that he says. So, if that's true, then how does this relate to the home? Right where you live. In fact, this gets very, very personal. Because when it's, if it's not real at home, then it's really not real, right? If it is real at home, then really it starts to, it starts to become real. I mean, when no one else is looking, and whether you're just alone and what you do then, how you proceed then, and how you dig in the word, and how you, ch- or just in your family. You know how family life is. That's where we probably need the most grace and the most love, right? You know, no one else can see us. You're having, having a big argument, and you're screaming at each other and yelling. The next thing you know, somebody calls and you answer it, and you're screaming, and then you just answer the phone and say, hello, because you want people to think you're really an awesome dude or a great girl and that you don't ever lose your temper but the we all know we do right we all know we tend to show the darker side of us when no one else is looking so how do you keep from being that guy well let me show you six key teachings of jesus you can build a home on just by going on these words of mine in the book of matthew in the sermon on the mount five six seven of matthew and here's, here's some key, six key teachings of Jesus you can build a home on. Number one, this is what you want to teach in your home. If, if you live by yourself, this is what you want to teach your own heart so that your home is welcoming of the Lord. And the number one thing, the inside is more important than the outside. Boy, don't we need that today more than ever. This seems to be the most materialistic time, the most materialistic place in the face of the earth, in the history of the earth. We are measured by materialism. There are reality shows not based upon anything except style, about how much people have. And and millions of people watch this day and night. 
So the inside is more important than the outside. Look at Matthew chapter 5, and let's just look at these words of mine, which are Jesus' words, what he says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard it said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So here's, here's what he says. is Look, yeah, you don't kill anybody, but I'm taking it a step further. Don't hate either. It, and, if, and then he goes on to say that if you hate, you've already committed murder. So he raises the bar. Why? Because we have such an advantage of the Holy Spirit coming inside of us, bringing conviction and leading and guiding us when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you do, the Lord lives inside of you and he changes you on the inside and he's stepping it up and he's saying, listen, what's on the inside is more important on the outside. And this hatred thing has gone rampant in our society, hasn't it? I mean, it is crazy hatred and what is happening. And, there's, and it's, 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 it's not only tearing families apart, it's tearing cities apart, turning our, tearing our country apart. That's why the inside is more important than the outside, but the reality is what's on the inside always comes on the outside. Verse 27, it talks about adultery. It says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman in lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the reality is just the inside is vital, and Jesus measures that. Number two, a principle you can build a house on. This is it. Materialism never satisfies. Materialism never satisfies. Look at chapter 6, verse 19. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, uh, he's saying this. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves, look at this, collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves don't break in and steal. In other words, there are things that are more important than material things, and what we learn is we need to sow towards those eternal things. We need to work for the things that last forever, not the things that are temporary. And then conversely, where spiritual eternal things last forever, conversely, the material things never really ever satisfy now, Visa and MasterCard don't want you to hear that. Amazon doesn't want you to know that. Every single thing that they're trying to sell on television, is the way they sell it to you is they're trying to convince you that if you only had this car or you only had these diamonds or you only had this or that, then you would be satisfied. And it's just not true. Because you know, you know statistically, the people who have more and have the most are the least happy because they bought into a lie. So we are to be satisfied. In fact, this time of Thanksgiving, as Pastor Scott was ministering to you and to me, just saying, listen, the, the secret of joy of this, war, of this life is being thankful, a heart of gratitude. He's exactly right. And gratitude, gratitude chases away this monster of materialism. So when you teach that to your children, about the eternal things and not just the, the materialistic things, then it sets them up for success. Here's the third thing. These six key teachings of Jesus, these teachings of mine. Prayer, and number three, prayer is the true source of life. Look with me at chapter 6, verse 5. So the disciples, they saw Jesus do all kinds of miracles. They saw him teach in front of thousands of people. And then they asked him this one question, Jesus, why don't you teach us how to pray like you pray? Realizing that Jesus' source of life was prayer. And this is our source of life. So number three, the source, prayer is the true source of life. And if you and I want to build our house on the rock, then prayer must be a consistent, meaningful part of your life. And when it is, great things take place. Prayer is essential. In fact, one person said, if you ain't praying... You're just playing, right? If you're not praying, you're just playing. And so when we are, when we are praying, we are experiencing this source of life. The psalmist said it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Where do you think that takes place? That rebooting, that, that renewing, that transformation that takes place in your heart, in my heart. Where does it take place? I'm telling you, it takes place in biblical prayer when it is driven by the word in an environment of worship and it's, it's being led by the spirit, then God begins to do something in your life and he begins to change me and change you. That's what he does. Number four, love from a pure heart. Love from a pure heart. And we, we see that very clearly in chapter five, verse 43. Chapter five, verse 43, and he says this. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. In other words, he raised the bar again. True love that comes from the heart to where you can even love those who want to hurt you, those that are against you. And so this is a God-shaped love. And if God shed his love, shed his love abroad within our heart, Romans chapter 5, then we have this hope that allows us to love others. If you're a very critical person, if you're a very hateful person, it's revealing that you haven't experienced the love of God. Because when, the, when God forgives you of your sins, you can forgive people of their sins. When God shows mercy, you can show mercy. But if you don't walk in mercy and you're not a grateful person, then more than likely you're not showing love. And this word here for love is agape or agape. It's this type of love that represents a God-type love. It's an unconditional type of love. This type of love is always gracious and always faithful. This type of love is generous and sacrificial. This type of love is putting others first. This type of love is positive and faith-filled. This type of love, it expresses openly and often. It's a type of love that just shows. And I'm, if you want to build your house on the rock, your home should be full of love. This type of agape love, to where there's just grace and there's mercy and putting others first, and sacrificial giving that is there. Let me tell you this. Love is fantastic. It's patient. It's kind. It bears burdens. It keeps no record of wrong. Wouldn't that be great to live with someone that doesn't remember all your faults? Wouldn't that be great? What would that do to your life? What would that do to the person you live around or live with? If you kept no record of wrong, you didn't even remember it, and you weren't building cases, how about just another, another characteristic out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, on love is this love believes all things. It believes the best things about people instead of jumping to negative conclusions. I'm telling you, it's building your house on a rock, and you and I need to do that because the storms are coming. And when there is love there, the way that love is described from our Lord and Savior, that there are real, no, there really aren't that aren't enemies, and, and we love our enemies, and we want the best about our enemies. That would be, wouldn't that be so radical? You, in fact, this is so unique, you don't see this in the world. So you would think that our, the best of us in a nation would be the one that everybody wants to be their leader, the presidents, you know? What if they had this concept? And even the best of us, the ones we want to be our presidents, none of them show this, right? So how radical is that? For you and I to show, to extend this kind of love to when those people don't deserve it. That's what we do. And when this is done in the home, it is incredible. But also, here, here's another, here's the fifth principle. Servant lifestyle is powerful. That, that these words of mine, as we are building, and this is the material, when we think of servant lifestyle, seeing that it's powerful, we look at chapter 5, verse 38. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, don't resist the evildoer. On the contrary, if someone slaps you on the, on the right cheek, turn the other one. As far as the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have it. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go within the second mile. So here's the background on that. You know, Rome had conquered Israel, and so they were occupying Israel as a ruler. And they were vicious, vicious people. And so there was an agreed-upon uh, rule that a soldier could make 
a citizen of Israel carry his pack just full of, of his armor and his, his, his material goods for him to live. And he could carry it. It's, you know, he would make him carry it all day long or all week or all month. But there became a rule, look, you can only make a guy carry it one mile. So you can imagine a Roman soldier pointing at some teenage boy and saying, get over here. He said, carry my pack. And then he has to carry his pack and they go a mile. He says, okay, I'll find someone else. And he says, no, 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 I can take it. And then go another mile. I mean, this in the face of an occupying enemy and serving them is incredibly powerful. How much more in our day? When we don't live in that kind of oppressive situation, but you choose to serve no matter what, and you serve one another. Jesus said, I've come to serve. I am a servant. He referred to himself like that all the time. And if you don't feel like serving, I'd have to ask you, sir, do you think you're better than Jesus? Do you, do you think that, do you, ma'am, do you think that you're, you're higher up on a status than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Because he served to the point Philippians chapter 2 says he became a servant even to the point of dying for you and for me. So serving others is very, very powerful. And you know what? When you teach children this, they catch it so fast. Children love to serve. When you bring them in a missional environment and we, you tell a child what we're doing here and what we're going to be doing, they sweep hard, they clean well, they do it with a smile, and it seems like they get it. But as we get older, sometimes we get a little more stingy. But I'm telling you, you build your house on a rock, when you begin to serve one another. And then lastly, look at the last verse in chapter 7. This is what it says. Verse, start with verse 28. Chapter 7, Matthew says this. When Jesus had finished his sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teachings because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like the scribes. He said, you've heard it said this, and then he would quote scriptures. He spoke as though he was speaking from God. And here's what, a house that is building on the rock, this last principle is this, Jesus' words have authority. Authority. So you and I read the words, and it truly directs our life. You read it as a family, and it directs your family. You, you memorize it, you meditate, you marinate in it. And it comes out in your life and you become the individual that honors the words of Jesus more than your own opinion. You honor the words of Jesus more than your own desires. And you are literally building your house on the rock. So you can go back to chapter 5. and You can say, blessed or happy. <laughs> blessed, 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 blessed. The blessings you can, receive, you can receive to the point that the storms will come, but you will stand no matter what. It's the words of Jesus. He says it very clearly that there are many that will come to me in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these religious things? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It's a stark Slap, mop in the face, shock to many people. It would be more preferable for you to be shocked now to hear this than to be shocked then and hear that. Because here's the reality. It doesn't matter what you say or what you think you do religiously. Are you taking the designer's material and building a home that lasts for eternity? It starts by you giving your life to Christ. Just simply say, Lord, I've blown it. I've gone down the Broadway. I've, I've tried to build a house on the sand because it was prettier there. It didn't build on the rock. You can easily, right now, he's inviting you through me. He's inviting you to say, I repent of my sins and I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Come in my life and make me new. Is that your prayer this morning? You may say, you know what? I can sense that I'm starting to build on sand. I want to get back the building on the rock. I want to get back to these principles. Well, here's what you do. Take these six. Here, here, here's some news. Listen, there's more than six. You know that. There's dozens in here. 
Another pastor and I were going over this this week, and we were looking at them. We were comparing them in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and we were just picking a few. Look, you should go home. If you want to take these words of Jesus and you want to dig deep, then you go back through these, this, well, the whole Bible, but take the Sermon on the Mount and find these principles and say, I need to work on this one. I need to work on this one. I need to work on this one. And you begin to dig deep, and you begin to build your house. If you, if you want to repent and start to build more on the sand, get in the Word and follow these principles. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you that your ways are different than our ways, that our ways lead to destruction, but your ways lead to life and life more than abundant. And Father, we pray that as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Lord, that we would focus on you, the things that are eternal. We would put a priority to the things that are on the inside and not just the outside. Lord, we would learn to love and serve, dig into your word deep, and build our house on the rock. Lord, I thank you for all the families and all the members of Glen Meadows that build on the rock and what a testimony they are. Lord, the way you've blessed them, even in storms, even in sickness, even in abandonment, even in famine, Lord, you have blessed. And Lord, we love you. Lord, just help us to worship you with all of our heart. Thank you for the accuracy of your word. Lord, might we receive it. But we pray in Jesus' name, amen.